What a joy it is to be able to open up the scriptures yet again with you, even if we are made to do so through this digital medium. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to reconnect with our study through the most joyous book in all the Bible, Paul's letter to the Philippians. Now, we find ourselves this morning in the bottom third of Philippians chapter 2, where we're introduced to a couple of dear friends of Paul, these ministry co-laborers. Now, it's no accident that the book of joy includes a section dedicated to faithful friends that you can count on. Now, perhaps you would agree this morning that a godly friendship enhances joy, especially within the context of Christianity. So this is a timely passage in an age of social distancing when we could all use a faithful friend. Now, I will say this. It wasn't until my latter teenage years that I appreciated or understood the precious nature of friendship. Growing up, my older brother, Anthony, and I spent nearly 10 years just the two of us. Then God provided what my mother called an unexpected miracle brother, what we would learn was more unwanted than unexpected, but uh, we have learned to love Dominic. Now, he was a joy to be around, especially for me, because for years I was the one exclusively being picked on by Anthony, but now it was his turn. There's one evening in particular when Dominic was in the seventh grade or the second grade, somewhere around seven or eight years old, where mom, mom asked me to just go into his room and check on him. You see, he wasn't quite himself when he got home from school. When I entered his room, I found him curled up facing the wall, and he was sobbing. I asked him what was wrong, and after some prodding, he reluctantly turned to me, tear-stained eyes, and simply said this, I don't have any friends. That shattered my heart. So for the next six months, a little brother that I enjoyed picking on became the young man I prayed for and prayed over every single night. And I prayed very specifically that God would provide for him faithful, godly friends. Well, God was gracious and soon Dominic made friends that he could count on. Now, my prayer for you this morning, but has been throughout the week, resembles that prayer I prayed for Dominic so many years ago, that God would provide for you faithful friends and that you would be a faithful friend to others. To help us navigate this friendship conversation, we're going to look at Paul's closing of Philippians chapter 2. Now, up to this point, Paul has, in the immediate context preceding this, elevated the humiliation of Jesus Christ, where he humbled himself through obedience unto death on the cross. Then Paul unveiled the exaltation of Jesus as Lord, whom God highly exalted and gave a name so profound that at the name of Jesus, every intelligent being in heaven on earth and under the earth would bow to his lordship. Now in our passage this morning, we're going to bump into two examples of men who lived out the example they were challenged to live out of Christ's humble example, but to do so in the context of relationships, of friendships. So let's pick up as Paul describes these two examples of humble, beautiful, God-honoring friends. He says in verse 19 this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all, and pause for a moment, they all likely refers to other believers or those who name the name of Jesus who are self-interested instead of being interested in things of Christ. And Paul says that. He says, for they are all seek their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know Timothy's proven worth. That idea of proven worth paints the picture of weights measured and found worthy like gold. He goes on to say, he has proven his worth. How as a son with his father, he has served with me in the gospel. Now I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. Pause for a moment. Even there in verse 23, Paul takes us back to chapter one where he isn't sure that he's going to survive his current imprisonment in Rome awaiting trial before Caesar. He says in verse 24, and I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself may also come to you. Paul was convinced that he was going to get out 
and make his way to encourage the Philippians in person. Verse 25 says, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker, my fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near to death, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Now I'm more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice in seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. In this glaring example of friends you can count on, Paul teaches us a little something about his friends. Friends you can count on show up. We see that all throughout this passage. Paul, under house arrest in Rome, chained 24 hours a day to a Roman soldier, could receive visitors. And several showed up, but among those who showed up were mentioned in our passage. That's Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now, if you read through the New Testament, you'll hear a lot about young Timothy. He was one of the dearest companions for Paul, and he's described that way in verse 22, where Paul calls him a spiritual son. You see, it was Paul who led Timothy ultimately to faith in Christ, building on the foundational teachings and testimonies of Timothy's mother and grandmother. But it was also Paul who discipled Timothy, who raised him up in the faith. Paul talked of Timothy in glowing terms, but perhaps he mentioned his great worth in the most profound way in verse 20. He says, I have no one like him. Timothy was one of a kind. He goes on to say, no one like him because he is genuinely concerned for your welfare. Paul embraced and understood Timothy's genuine concern for Paul as he was by his side. But he also trusted that Paul and or Timothy had genuine concern for the Philippian church as well. He calls him genuinely concerned, which really speaks to an authenticity. Timothy showed up with sincerity. That's hard to come by in friendship, isn't it? If you hang around people long enough, you'll find that typically even our friends are in it for what's in it for them. Having those who love you for who you are without desiring some sort of dividend or bonus in return. And Paul, trusting that Timothy was selfless, made a selfless decision. Appreciating Timothy's sincere concern so much, he planned to send Timothy to Philippi so that Timothy might minister there during Paul's imprisonment. So we have Timothy, a friend who showed up with sincerity, but also Epaphroditus. He was another friend who showed up. When the Philippians heard of Paul's imprisonment, they dispatched Epaphroditus with a financial gift designed to take care of Paul's needs while under house arrest. And Epaphroditus showed up but he showed up very uniquely as a servant. He showed up with service in mind. He was doing laundry, cleaning house, cooking food, running errands. He did all that he could to take care of Paul. Now these men, both Timothy and Epaphroditus, were friends who showed up with all sincerity and service to bless Paul in his burdensome season. And they were reliable. Maybe you've heard it said that your greatest ability is availability. I would suggest a different twist. Your greatest ability as a friend is reliability. You see, reliability marries together availability and loyalty. And loyalty is key as it denotes consistency no matter the cost. Author and pastor Kent Hughes said of loyalty this way. He said, loyalty is indispensable to the survival of a friendship. I believe that to be true. Paul's friends were loyal. They were reliable. And friends that you can count on make the time. And wait for the time. They make the time to show up and stay as long as it takes. Question, do you have reliable friends? Are you a reliable friend? One who shows up for the right reasons and serves no matter the cost. You see, friends you can count on 
show up, but they also speak out. Both Timothy and Epaphroditus were messengers by nature of their relationship with Paul while he was in prison. They were sent on behalf of their home home churches. And Paul would receive the message from the home church. And then he would send these two back to their churches with a word of truth, whether a, a truth of commendation or correction. Now their relationship was built foundationally on the truth captured in the simple yet significant gospel or good news of Jesus Christ. Paul says so much in verse 22. He said in recommending Timothy, he says he served with me in the gospel. The gospel implies proclamation or clinging to what is the theme of every letter of Paul. And that is the good news that Jesus came to not only live the life we couldn't live, but die the death we deserve to die in our place so that he might rise again and offer to us, securing the work on the cross through his resurrection, eternal life, a life that we could never earn. And so the gospel was really the the baseline for correction and commendation within the church. So for Paul and his friends, their entire relationship was built on leveraging the truth for the sake of the gospel. And Paul led the way in speaking out truth in love. You catch a sense of this if you study the letters that he wrote that make up a good portion of the New Testament. He encouraged, he comforted, he assured the churches with the truth of the gospel. But he also rebuked and corrected. He challenged churches and even individuals with that same gospel. Hear me. A faithful friend speaks out truth in love for the gospel's sake at all times. I don't know about you, but I need people in my life who will tell me what I don't necessarily want to hear, but need to hear. And what I need to hear is always tied to the gospel of Jesus. What we need to be leery of in our current culture where we find friends quicker to quote a romantic comedy than they are scripture, a sense of leeriness when it comes to what I call anti-gospel statements that typically come from well-meaning friends. The kind of statements that are ruinous if applied. One such statement sounds like this. Follow your heart. Don't do it. I care about you. Don't do it. We need friends who are going to say, your heart stinks. Follow the heavenly father, not your heart. Another anti-gospel statement, well intended, but ruinous when applied is this. Do what you feel. Do what feels right. We need friends that will say, do what is right, regardless of how you feel. Another anti-gospel statement may sound something like this. You deserve to be happy. I can't tell you how many marriages that I've bumped into where the friend of one of the spouses or a group of friends who are miserable in their own marriages or are plagued by divorce will say to that friend who they love, but certainly don't show it in their conversation, might say something like this. Listen, leave him or her. You deserve to be happy. Bail on what God has called. You deserve to be happy. By the way, the gospel reminds us that we can remove the word deserve from our language. We need friends who will come along and say, you don't deserve to be happy. What you really deserve with great gentility is hell. If we're going to work on the fairness meter, we deserve hell. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By his grace, you have been saved. That's gospel. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Grace found in the gospel is the antithesis, the opposite of what we deserve. We need friends who will say what we need to hear even when we don't want to hear it. We need friends who will speak out gospel truth in love. Maybe you're thinking, Pastor, it's not my place It's none of my business. If you've been around Oak City any period of time, you'll know my thought on that. 
If you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you profess faith in him, then the Bible says you are a child of God. We sang about it just a moment ago. And if you're a child of God, that makes you my brother or sister in Christ, which means we are family in Jesus. And family is always my business. You don't mess with my kids or my wife. Why? Because it's my business. And you don't mess with me because my wife who is pregnant will come at you and you don't want to face that. Why? Because we're family. My family is my business. Oak City family, what I do with my life, the decisions I make is your business. And we hide behind this cloak of cowardice when we use the cop out, it's none of my business. No, it is. And you are. You're worth having the awkward conversation. Is why? Because friends, you can out count on, speak out gospel truth in love. Maybe this morning you would join me in praying for a friend that doesn't cater to your emotions, but a friend who communicates the scripture, sows the gospel, upholds righteousness, and is willing to correct and rebuke us when needed. You see, friends you can count on, they show up and they speak out but they also spend much. As we noted earlier, Epaphras' ministry might be summed up in one word, service. I mean, he traveled from Philippi to Rome. That's an 800-mile, three-month journey. And he did so with a financial donation from the church for Paul's provision, and we see that in Philippians 4.18. But I need you to hear me. The greatest expense came not in the form of cash, but care. Epaphroditus spent his friendship in humble service to Paul. And he did so in obscurity. He was the least known of the men mentioned in our passage. Paul was the well-regarded, widely known church planter. Timothy was the up-and-coming pastor and Epaphroditus was a nobody by comparison. Yet in his friendship, he chose faithfulness over fame. In his friendship, he chose service over stardom. He ministered in obscurity and it almost cost him his life. Paul makes note of that in verse 30 when he says this, For he, Epaphroditus, nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Now this passage suggests, while we are unaware of the exact nature of his illness, the passage suggests that the illness of Epaphroditus was due in part to his labors for the Lord in serving Paul. And Paul says, listen, he risked his life to serve me. Now that phrase, risking his life, literally means to be thrown aside, to, to gamble. In fact, it, the word became a noun with the formation of a group of Christians in the third century. They called themselves, this is a fantastic name, the gamblers. <laughs> After this verse and in honor of Epaphroditus, whenever and wherever the plague hit in the third century, these gamblers would rush in to take care of the sick, but also bury the dead. They were willing, quite literally, to spend their very lives to live out tangible expressions of the love of God captured in the gospel. You see, Epaphroditus, there was nothing more important than doing what God had called him to do, even if it cost him everything. Such sacrificial friendship is noted within Scripture in particular in the words and ministry of Jesus Christ, who in John 15, verse 13, said this, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. What a powerful word. As a matter of fact, that has been among my life verses since I came to faith in Christ as a teenager. As a matter of fact, if you were to go to First Baptist Church, Sevierville today, just before completing construction of the new sanctuary, our church family was invited in to write our favorite scriptures on the steps leading up to the altar. Well, my brother, Anthony, wrote a scripture that doesn't exist. I'm pretty sure he went with Judges 49. It's not a passage. But I went with John 15, 13, because I couldn't quite get over that type of sacrificial friendship, that Jesus saw me in the mess that I was, 
bleeding out spiritually speaking, rejecting him for all of my life up to the point of salvation. And yet he would desire to save me and then call me friend. Epaphroditus was that kind of friend. We need friends you can count on. Friends who are invested into God's will, but also your well-being, physical, emotional, but primarily spiritual well-being, no matter the cost. You see, friends you can count on show up, and if needed, they lay down their lives for your good. I recently read about a friendship much like that. Two friends grew up together in the early part of the 20th century. When World War I broke out, they enlisted together, they trained together, and they served together. They found themselves separated on one occasion in the heat of battle. One lay critically wounded in the open battlefield while the other was huddled in a bunker with his commanding officer. Now, we requested permission to try and reach his injured friend, but he was denied by the officer. In fact, the officer said that it would be suicidal. So when the officer turned his back, the soldier bolted out of the bunker towards his friend, dodging bullets along the way. He eventually staggered back to the foxhole. His friend was now dead. He himself had been shot multiple times and he lay dying in that bunker next to his deceased friend. The officer was both angry but also deeply moved. He he shouted, what a waste. He's dead and now you're dying. It wasn't worth it, soldier. To which the man replied with his final words, oh yes it was, Sarge. When I got to him, the only thing he said was, I knew you'd come. I knew you'd come. When Paul needed a friend in prison, his life hanging in the balance, two friends showed up. And Paul, based on this writing, knew they'd come. He knew they'd show up. Because they knew Paul was worth it. Do you have a friend like that that you can count on? For the believer, are you a friend that others can count on? If the answer is no, then why not pray specifically today and in the days ahead, God, would you give me faithful friends and help me to be the faithful friend that others can count on? Ultimately, there's no more worthy, faithful friend than Jesus. It's in a relationship with him that we learn how to be faithful friends. I mean, think about his testimony. When we were wounded in sin, losing the war against darkness, Jesus left the safety of heaven for the battlefield of earth. He took on enemy fire, and when he was crucified in our place, he showed us greater love by laying down his life for his friends. Do you know Jesus as your friend, as your Savior? Have you placed the full weight and trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins. If not, then today he's calling you. You say, well, how do you know, pastor? Because the God of the universe and the Son of God did not bleed out so that you might wonder or be inspired by his work. Jesus suffered, died, and rose again so that you would be indwelt by his Spirit. That means you, yes, you, phony at times, broken, messy you. Jesus longs to be your savior and he longs to be your friend. So maybe today you respond. I knew you'd come, Jesus. I knew it. And receive in faith the free gift that he offers today. I'd like to lead you in a prayer right now for those of you who say, I need this Jesus to be my savior. You can pray with all sincerity and Jesus will swoop in, not only save the day, but save your soul. Adopt you into the family of God and bring you into this family that we know of as Christianity. Maybe you can pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I am broken. I am a sinner on my best day. And I know that I have separated myself from you. But I believe, pray that, say, I believe that you, Jesus, died in my place so that I could be forgiven. Pray, I believe that you rose again so that I could have eternal life. 
So right here, right now, by faith, I receive your free gift of salvation, grace, forgiveness, and adoption. I am yours, Jesus, forevermore. Thank you for wanting to be my friend. In your name I pray, amen. And maybe you prayed that, and we celebrate with you. If you meant it, God, I believe, through his grace, rescued you in Christ. And you now begin this spiritual journey. And we want to walk with you in that journey, to help you along in that journey. So let us know. You can direct message our Facebook page. You can reach out to us with any of the contact information we have. We want to resource you moving forward as you walk in this joy journey with Jesus. For everyone else, know that we have a friend in Jesus. But the world needs a friend in us. So let's pray even now. God, would you provide for me in my life faithful friends who will step up, show up, speak out, and spend much. And more than that, Father, would you make me that kind of friend to others? And watch how God grows his family and encourages many hearts along the way. I hope you've been encouraged this morning. I can't wait to be able to say this in the room with you, to look at your faces, to see your families together, and to celebrate Jesus. Until then, keep tuning in and know that we love you and miss you.